Check it out now, y'all. Nano Hub U Online Instruction. In this lecture, we'd like to um, uh, continue our discussion of nuclear reactions, and we like to spend a little bit of time discussing uh, fusion reactions and uh, explain to you why they're they're interesting. Um, to begin, it's probably uh, worthwhile to uh, just provide a brief timeline for fusion, um, and I I believe the, the the discussion has to start. In 1905, when Einstein predicts this famous E equals mc squared equation, uh, this, this equation says that uh, mass can be converted to energy, uh, and uh, this, this sort of laid the, uh, the groundwork for um, uh, uh, the discussion of, of both fission and fusion reactions. Um, the, uh, it's, it's interesting to note that the concept of an isotope uh, was, was finally, was, was uh, first put forward in 1913 by uh, this guy Soddy in England. Uh, he received the 1921 Nobel Prize in Chemistry for this, this, this idea. And uh, it took a few years uh, uh, for uh, experimental verification of isotopes to be, uh, to be demonstrated. Uh, these demonstrations were done again in England uh, with the invention of a mass spectrometer by Aston. And what he, uh, what Aston did is he accurately measured the masses of many low mass elements. So he, he was able to show that, uh, in fact, uh, hydrogen and helium and lithium uh, have uh, different isotopes, which indicate that uh, they have different masses, and these different masses are, of course, related to the different different number of neutrons that uh, form the uh, nuclei in these different uh, chemical elements. So chemically, the isotopes all behave the same. It's just that uh, their, their nuclei uh, are have different masses depending on how many neutrons are jammed in. Um, uh, uh, this guy Eddington, also from England, combined Aston's uh, very accurate mass measurements of the different isotopes with Einstein's equals mc squared equation. And he, uh, I think he gets credit for, uh, as the first person to propose that large, large amounts of energy could be released by fusing small nuclei uh, together. And, um, uh, he, so he, he basically introduced the idea of fusion. Uh, it took another nine years or so before two scientists uh, uh, provided estimates for the rate of nuclear fusion in stars. So it, it's, it started to slowly dawn on people that the tremendous amount of energy released by our sun and other stars in the galaxy uh, might be explained by uh, this, this fusion uh, nuclear reaction. So 1929, Atkinson and Hooterman's uh, provided estimates for the rate of nuclear fusion in stars. Those were the early, uh, those were the early uh, uh, theoretical estimates. 1932, uh, this, this gentleman Oliphant, again in England, uh, he discovers uh, that he can produce uh, heavier elements, and, and in particular helium-3 and tritium. Uh, they're produced by bombarding targets with uh, heavy water. Heavy water contains uh, deuterium uh, nuclei. And, um, and the uh, nuclear reactions that Oliphant was able to uh, uh, achieve was to take uh, deuterium, which is this one neutron, one proton isotope of hydrogen. Uh, he bombarded other deuterium nuclei, so this is known as a DD. Uh, nuclear reaction because it's deuterium on deuterium. And he was able to show that you could produce uh, tritium, which is uh, a, another isotope of hydrogen, or you could produce this helium-3, which, which is a lighter isotope of the more common helium-4 uh, uh, nucleus for helium. And the, uh, the, uh, these nuclear reactions uh, released uh, four and 4.03 and 3.3 uh, million electron volts of energy. So uh, this was this was uh, what was demonstrated in 1932, and then finally 1939, Bethe in uh, the U.S. 
uh, shows in detail how fusion powers the stars. So he worked out the nuclear reactions, uh, the fusion nuclear reactions that are required to understand why a star shines and why it releases such tremendous amounts of, of energy. And for his work in, uh, in uh, explaining fusion, he received the 1967 Nobel Prize in Physics. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to um, uh, just, just remind you of, of, uh, of, of, the, of, of the energy, that, how to calculate the energy that's released uh, when two nuclei fuse together. And, and so I, I just consider a typical fusion reaction. This is an example, right? You've got two hydrogen nuclei. Uh, these hydrogen nuclei are different isotopes of hydrogen. They come together and it's possible for them to form helium-4. Uh, so this is a helium nucleus with two protons, two neutrons, and one excess neutron. And um, you can tell this is a valid chemical or valid nuclear reaction because the number of protons on the left add up to the number of protons on the right, and the total number of nucleons on the left add up to the total number of nucleons on the right. So it could be a valid uh, nuclear reaction. And the question is, um, how much energy is released in, in these products, uh, uh, if, if such a, a reaction can occur. And, um, I just worked through that calculation more. It's the, the arithmetic is pretty straightforward. Uh, but it's, it, it just gives rise to the idea that, uh, the, uh, the kinetic energy of the, um, uh, helium two, uh, 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 nuclei plus the kinetic energy K of the helium-3 nuclei, those kinetic energies have to be added on the left-hand side of the equation. You also have to take into account the possibility that the uh, products, the helium-4 and the excess neutron, have kinetic energy, and so those kinetic energies are explicitly included on the right-hand side of the equation. Uh, we're interested in a nuclear reaction, so we're using nuclear masses. Uh, and what we have to do, of course, is we have to convert the nuclear masses to atomic masses. Uh, we do that by adding electrons to both sides of the equation to convert these, these nuclei into uh, atoms. Uh, once we know the atomic masses, then, then uh, once we have an equation that lists the atomic masses, we can look up those atomic masses in tables and, and then actually perform a calculation. Um, the way the calculation works out is we define a, a, a parameter Q, which is basically equal to the difference between the masses before uh, the nuclear reaction minus the masses after the nuclear reaction. And this Q factor is basically related to the difference in the kinetic energy of the input particles minus the, uh, the I'm sorry, the kinetic energy of the output particles, right, these two guys minus the kinetic energy of the input particles, so the kinetic energy produced by the, the particles before they collide. If the uh, kinetic energy of the output particles is greater than the kinetic energy of the input particles, then this, this nuclear reaction could proceed. And uh, so, I, you know, the, the next line here just works out the arithmetic. You can look up these, uh, these atomic masses. They're known with high accuracy. You can, you can calculate the mass difference. And then you have to calculate, you have to translate that mass difference into a, uh, an energy by using the, con the, uh, the uh, conversion between million electron volts, 931.5 MeV, uh, to, to one atomic mass unit, U. And you find out that there's uh, about 17.6 million electron volts worth of energy released in this, this, uh, this reaction, which combines two, lo two lighter nuclei to form one heavier, one heavy nucleus plus a neutron. And so this kinetic energy is then distributed, right, uh, between, uh, uh, it's the difference in kinetic energy between the uh, output and the input uh, uh, kinetic energies of the particles. And um, so uh, this, this mass difference is, is really converted into kinetic energy in this process. And this kinetic energy then uh, serves to uh, 
heat up or uh, um, uh, radiate energy from, from this, this particular nuclear reaction. The, um, the other point to make about uh, nuclear fusion is that uh, when you're combining two nuclei together, right, the nuclei uh, have net positive charges, and that means that there's a Coulomb barrier that has to be overcome. So if, if you, uh, for instance, take this deuterium nucleus and you cause it to approach this, this tritium nucleus, which is uh, hydrogen with two neutrons, right? There's a, there's a, there's a peak in the, uh, in the barrier that's related to the uh, Coulomb repulsion of this nucleus from that one. Uh, the size of that Coulomb barrier can be estimated, right? And, and you can estimate it because you know that the, the, the radius, uh, the radius of the nucleus is on the order of 10 to the minus 15 meters. Uh, you'd like to believe that the potential energy is related to the uh, charges on the, uh, the two nuclei, so you can calculate what the potential energy of repulsion is uh, between these two nuclei when they're separated by about 10 to the minus 15 meters. And you find out that this barrier is about 1.4 million electron volts, and that just simply means for this nuclei, this nucleus to approach uh, the, uh, the the tritium nucleus, you you have to provide at least 1.4 million electron volts worth of, of energy. So that's the barrier for for uh, generating a nuclear fusion reaction, and um, you have to either accelerate these nuclei to high energies, or you got to compress these nuclei together so that they get very close with an extremely high external pressure in order for the, 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 the two nuclei to fuse together. Um, well, the, uh, the high pressure and high temperature required to produce fusion, that's accomplished in a star, and, um, and that then explains uh, why stars uh, radiate uh, energy, because the energy they radiate is basically produced by these fusion nuclear reactions. So, um, uh, to to try to lay out the, the big picture, uh, uh, there's, a, there's this idea that uh, billions of years ago, uh, a big bang occurred. This bang, big bang produced 80% uh, uh, hydrogen, about 20% helium, plus trace amounts of other chemical elements. Uh, these hydrogen and helium atoms, uh, over time, condensed to form stars. And uh, there are basically two, uh, two categories of stars that are uh, interesting in order to discuss fusion nuclear reactions. One type of star has a mass comparable to the mass of our sun, and that star is powered by proton-proton fusion chain reactions. And those proton-proton chain reactions produce predominantly helium. Uh, the other possibility is that these primordial gases can condense into a mass which is uh, considerably greater than the mass of our sun. And uh, when, when you get a, a, a large star like that, then it's a different fusion cycle that produces the energy, right? So it's a carbon-nitrogen-oxygen fusion cycle, uh, and um, it produces uh, respectively carbon atoms, nuclear nitrogen atoms and oxygen atoms in the process of fusing lighter uh, uh, elements together. So two, two completely different categories of stars, two completely different categories of nuclear fusion reactions. And uh, which, which one takes place basically depends on the mass of the star that's formed. Um, uh, once the process of nuclear fusion is understood uh, to be the source of energy in these stars, then you can begin to discuss the life cycle of a star. And of course, this is a topic that's of, of uh, a great interest in, in astronomy today. Uh, you, can, you can get some very nice pictures from the web that, that summarize these life cycles. And they basically uh, uh, depend on whether the mass of the star is uh, has a mass comparable to that of our sun, or whether the mass of the star is uh, uh, considerably greater than the mass of our sun. 
In the case of an average star, an average sun, uh, what basically happens is this fusion reaction continues uh, until all the fuel is expended. Uh, once all the fuel is expended, then uh, the, the remaining uh, core of the star uh, rapidly expands. It forms what's known as a red giant, and that red giant then explodes and produces planetary nebulae, and these planetary, planetary nebulae then glow in, in, uh, in the visible region of the electromagnetic spectrum. So the reason they glow in the, region, in the visible region of the electromagnetic spectrum is that after the red giant uh, explodes, it blows off a lot of uh, gas in the form of gas clouds. There's a hot core that's left remaining. This hot core generates ultraviolet radiation. The ultraviolet radiation interacts with the atoms in these clouds. And uh, in the process that we've discussed, uh, really the first, first week of the semester, right? UV radiation excites electrons of the gas atoms in the clouds. When these, uh, these uh, uh, excited electrons decay back to the ground state, uh, they they produce visible radiation. So if the um, uh, if the clouds are made up of let's say predominantly hydrogen and helium gas, then you would expect to see hydrogen and helium lines emitted from these planetary uh, nebulae that that surround this very hot dense dense core of of the uh, the star after it's run its course. So this is a, an example of one of the planetary nebulae. It's called the Cat's Eye Nebulae. Uh, you, can, you can get these great pictures on the web, and they show the different colors of light that are emitted from these gas clouds that surround uh, the remnants of this, this um, red giant star. So that's, that's, the, uh, that's the end of uh, end cycle of an average star, right? You end up with these, these uh, very... Uh, beautifully colored gas clouds. The other option is to uh, consider what happens to a massive star. A massive star produces this thing called a red supergiant, uh, and the red supergiant then explodes and produces this, this thing called a supernova. So uh, for the uh, very heavy stars, basically what happens is the outer core of the star is powered by a hydrogen-helium uh, fusion reaction. This hydrogen-helium fusion reaction persists until all the hydrogen is, is, is burned up. Uh, then the helium starts to combine in order to form carbon. So there's then a shell of the star in which the helium is converted to carbon by fusion. Uh, that continues until all the helium is expended. Uh, then the carbon starts to combine in the carbon shell to produce neon. Uh, that continues until all the carbon is expended. Uh, the neon then uh, fuses uh, to form oxygen. That's in a neon burning shell. That continues until all the neon is expended. Uh, uh, the oxygen then combines to form silicon. The silicon then uh, combines to form iron. And so eventually you end up with this inert iron core which is very hot and very dense um, at the center of the star. Um, so these these uh, these various nuclear reactions are, are, are illustrated in this 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 panel here, and uh, sequentially each shell uh, burns for a period of time until the uh, elements that fuel that that fusion reaction disappear. Once the star uh, reaches its end state. Uh, it, it, it explodes, and it, it explodes in the, in the form of a supernova. Uh, so there's, there's been a few supernovas that have been observed experimentally. This is the, this is the one that was observed in 1987. We, I, I was actually around to see this happen. Uh, this shows the, the location of a star before the supernova explosion. This shows the position of the same star after the supernova explosion. So when the supernova explosion occurs, it just blows off all these, these uh, elements that have been produced in the process of fusion, and those elements are then dispersed throughout space and can condense and form into uh, uh, 
uh, planets and, uh, and, and form solar systems, uh, very similar to the one that, that we live in, uh, today on Earth. So, um, uh, supernova explosions are incredibly intense bursts of energy, right? That's just unimaginable. And again, uh, how to explain that and uh, to, to describe the processes, that's a, that's a topic of considerable interest to, uh, to astronomers. Um, I should mention that um, there's an effort on Earth to control this fusion. This effort has been ongoing for at least 60 years. Uh, there's not been a whole lot of success in terms of uh, um, making energy from fusion, uh, but this doesn't uh, 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 stop scientists from trying to improve in this process. Uh, the latest uh, 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 effort is this interna international uh, thermonuclear experimental reactor. Reactor. It's called ITER. It's uh, it's actually located in France. It's uh, it's a collaboration between 35 nations, and they're building this huge instrument to try to uh, uh, control a, a, a nuclear fusion reaction. In a, in a toroid that is surrounded by very intense magnetic fields. So the estimated cost of this, uh, this device is something like 13 billion euros. Uh, the cost keeps going up every year as delays in the design uh, uh, of this very complicated piece of equipment uh, uh, mount. Uh, they're basically trying to produce a hydrogen plasma that, uh, that forms a toroidal shape. Uh, they want to heat that hydrogen plasma to about 100 million degrees centigrade. And uh, the idea is once you get hydrogen gas that hot, uh, it's going to uh, produce something like 500 megawatts of fusion power. Uh, so the advantage of the fusion reactor over the fission reactor is, of course, the fusion reactor does not produce uh, radioactive uh, 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 isotopes. Uh, it just produces heavier isotopes. Uh, that are not radioactive. So um, there would be an advantage to this type of reactor over a fission reactor if it could be made to, uh, to operate. Uh, you can ask, when is this, uh, this sort of thing going to occur? Um, well, the deadline keeps getting pushed back. Uh, according to the web pages I've just read recently, they're thinking that maybe by 2022 or 2023, uh, this, uh, this instrument will have been designed, debugged, and actually work. Uh, that assumes, of course, that, that all the 35 nations that are contributing money to this can uh, st stay the course and stay focused on this, uh, this reactor. So we'll, we'll have to wait and see. I think the jury's still out on, on this, uh, this topic. So uh, that ends a brief discussion of fusion reactions. And it kind of opens the door towards uh, uh, an outlook on astronomy where this, this, this type of fusion reaction is extremely important in understanding the life cycle of stars. Uh, so up next, uh, the course is, is rapidly coming to an end, right? And up next, um, I'd like to just give a few final thoughts uh, before we uh, 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 close the books on this semester. And... Um, try to sum up uh, what we've discussed uh, for the past uh, 16 weeks or so. So hope to see you for that final lecture and um, uh, um, we'll, uh, we'll summarize the course in that lecture. So thank you for listening to this one.